Welcome to Voices of IFIS. In this episode, you're going to hear from Kuzipa Nawamba. She's a program director at the World Council of Churches and former Zafis Zambia staff. She invites us to see the big picture perspective offered in Psalm 90 and the choice we have to adopt it. Salamat Hagi. Mwazio Kenny. Good morning. I give thanks to God and to the IFES leadership for the invitation to return home in this capacity. Yes, my sisters and brothers, I am from the WCC, and I bring you greetings and warm congratulations on the 76th uh, uh, anniversary of the IFES. Uh, the WCC celebrated its 75th uh, anniversary, so it's one year younger than the IFES. Before I begin, I would just like to contextualize myself uh, a little bit more. After being shortlisted for uh, the job uh, in WCC, I was told that there was a sentiment not to hire me because I was evangelical. Uh, the 12 years I was with IFES represent uh, nearly one third of my work history, so it's quite prominent uh, in my CV. The general secretary who made the final decision uh, to hire me uh, phoned me uh, a few days before he interviewed me and told me that he himself was actually raised uh, in the IFES in the Norwegian movement. The ripple of God's work through IFES these past 75 years has spread even to the WCC. In the context of a shrinking global multilateral space, I ask myself the question, can Christian organizations covenant for justice to begin to speak to one another for the well-being of people and planet. And I speak as someone with significant responsibility in my role for the formation of young and emerging theologians. At the Bosse Institute, we provide a scholarship for young and emerging theologians to live learn and dialogue with one another. We have a responsibility, dear sisters and brothers, to pass on to the next generation, not just the caricatures of what we think of each other, but the substantive nature of the differences that have been there within our history, and also to pass on the responsibility to the coming generation that they need not trade with each other in stereotypes, that they can engage honestly and truthfully and find a path for, towards uh, Christian solidarity. And so as we uh, think together uh, on the prayer uh, uh, that has just been uh, so well read to us, let us uh, consider uh, how the God who is faithful from one generation to the other uh, is able to lead us uh, on this path. What I will offer mostly are really exegetical comments uh, on the psalm, and I hope and trust that we will, uh, as we uh, reflect together, find you know, different hermeneutics of entering uh, into this passage. Uh, by way of providing you know, an entry into that, I bring some questions for reflection uh, in the course of offering what I am going to say. So first of all, just a little bit of uh, the background, and I would like to um, echo what Dr. Riyadh said uh, at the beginning, that uh, this uh, Psalm, Psalm 90, is at the beginning of book four of uh, the Psalter. It seems to echo the plea that Moses made on behalf of the people of Exodus in chapter 13. It's a psalm of wisdom that draws from the same intellectual and theological situation as Ecclesiastes. 
Psalm 90 begins the section that is uh, uh, between uh, 90, uh, the Psalms 90 and 106. And it's the only Psalm that is uh, ascribed to Moses. The attribution to Moses is likely intended uh, to take the reader back in time uh, to, the, to when the Israelites were in the desert. This liturgical reference to Moses underlines its theme as a prayer to God uh, as refuge. For people whose uh, experience in exile entailed loss of land, loss of temple, their prayer to God as refuge was a significant one. So the deep theological message of this psalm uh, is therefore that even without land, temple, and monarchy, or you could put it differently and say without property, without a sense of security, and without power, it is still possible to have a profound relationship with God, as was the case with Moses. In that regard, Book four of the Psalms reimagines and seeks to understand God during a time when Israel is in exile, is scattered, and is under imperial domination. The systemic justice questions that we ask ourselves today, whether it be eco justice, whether it be uh, you know the e economic justice, echo the experience of Israel during this time. And like Israel, we ask, what does it mean to confess deep faith in God as refuge, even when we are perplexed about what God's perceived inaction in the face of systemic dispossession, displacement, and disempowerment actually means? When we look at uh, Psalm 90, its uh, theme of God as refuge uh, continues uh, in Psalm 91 up to uh, verse 2, you know, of that uh, portion. And, you know, this section uh, seems to provide a response to the why questions that we looked at uh, that in Psalm 88, but also uh, in Psalm uh, 89. And, you know, these recall a moment when the children of Israel questioned God's actions and perceived inaction in their situation of powerlessness and defeat. The psalmist's prayer to God is, why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? You have renounced the covenant with your servant and have defiled, his uh, have defiled his crown in the dust, Psalm 88, uh, verse 14, which is echoed in Psalm 89, uh, verse 39 as well. The questions of that time represent the questions of all people who stand in a difficult place today, where they question God's seeming inaction in the face of myriads of justice issues uh, in our world. Psalm 90 seems to answer uh, that question with the opening, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. So rather than reference the questions, the reference is to God, who is uh, the stability, who is the anchor regardless of what uh, looks like a rudderless uh, existence. The psalmist holds the unresolved questions that cause him to lament side by side with resolute faith in God. His prayer that affirms God's presence through all generations gives perspective to live through his unresolved situation. What we say to and about God in prayer is powerful 
And again, I, ref I refer to what uh, Dr. Riyadh said uh, at the beginning of our time together, referencing you know, the Psalms as prayed ethics. Because we say them to God, our prayers commit us to a certain course of action. When we pray to a God who is faithful through all generations, we commit to living faithfully ourselves and to passing on that faithfulness to the next generation because we say it before God. So the prayers that we say, the songs that we sing, shape the way that we come before God. They have power to educate, to impart a theology, to inculcate an ethic. So let's uh, just reflect briefly on Psalms as prayed ethics in Christian uh, worship. Psalms were central to the Old Testament uh, liturgical life, and they are the most prayed texts in the Old Testament among Jewish and Christian people. Their use as hymns and prayers in worship make them unique. As worship, hymns and psalms are sung prayers. As St. Augustine of Hippo says, to sing is to pray twice. And I come from a culture of call and response, you know, type of singing, where quite often we sing the same line repetitively. And we were also reminded of the power of memorization and repetition as a way of shaping our ethic and shaping how we come uh, into life. And Wenham also says, you know, because when we sing, you know, song grips both mind and will, and he says, I quote, commits the worshiper to particular attitudes and patterns of behavior. What we utter in prayer, like I said earlier, to and about God profoundly affects us as our prayers commit us to a path of action. When we pray to God for redress of injustice, dispossession, domination, and disempowerment. We turn that on ourselves and question how we come into life in relation to those very attributes. We identify with God as the standard for justice. Speaking in a personal and in a solemn way in prayer, we invite God to examine our motives, our actions, against the standard that God has set. In verses 1 to 12, uh, we see the psalmist praising God as eternal refuge. Psalm 90 contrasts God's permanence with the frailty of humanity in a time when the community life of Israel would no longer be mediated uh, through uh, a temple or a king. Israel's only source of hope was Yahweh, and that is stated in verses 1 and 2. God is Israel's gift of home when they are homeless and without land, as they, uh, as they do not have a reliable place that they can call home, and reliable references that gave them uh, security. The contrast between God's permanence and human frailty is the basis for the lament that we find in the first part of this psalm from verses 1 to 6. As a community of prayer, uh, as a community of prayer to God for help, the psalmist uh, complains to God in verses 1 to 7 about a situation that seems never to resolve. The people are overwhelmed because of God's wrath. They groan and sigh under God's anger. Their historical reality of exile echoes other times of national and personal crisis when God did not seem to answer their prayers or when God delayed to answer their prayers 
and trouble and war was what dominated their lives and their thinking. Even when we wait for months or years for a resolution, there is still one place to find refuge in God. We must call upon God who is eternal and who is the judge of all and whose perspective of time defies our own. That is expressed in verse 4. And so in this section of the psalm, the psalmist ends with a petition to God. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That is a reminder that time is a gift that God gives us to be used wisely. And so for reflection, I pose these questions. What is our attitude towards God's gift of time? Personally, and as student movements, and as the entire IFES. What does it mean for a student to gain a heart of wisdom? And I should add, what does it mean to form students to have a heart of wisdom? IFES staff work, and I know from experience, can be relentless and even discouraging. What do staff uh, workers draw from Psalm 90 for encouragement during those moments? At 76, what, what does it mean for IFES to number its days and to gain a heart of wisdom? Some of the answers have been given in the many reflections that we have had uh, in this assembly. I submit those questions for your reflection. In the latter section of uh, the psalm, verses 13 to 17, uh, there is a petition of wisdom. The psalmist uh, focuses on the brevity of human life. Wisdom literature uh, draws lessons from life experiences for instance, that Moses saw the promised land but died before he entered it is a paradigm for Israel's, own, uh, uh, for Israel's own experience and our own uh, frail existence. And I think it puts meaning into uh, nurturing the next generation. It's very different from my personal biography extending into the next generation. It's living faithfully so that my legacy, our legacy, will commit the next generation to continue where we left off. After Moses left the scene, uh, the exodus into the promised land still continued. His life indicates that however far short we come, in terms of time, intentions, and accomplishments, even when we put in our best efforts, we are still frail and it still does not on itself, on its own, accomplish the task. Today's theme uh, is the theme of justice. That theme reminds us just how much and how often we come up short in our attempts to uphold God's standards in the way we live and the way we use the gifts that God has given us, the gift of time, the gift of possession, and the gift of power and intellect. In our best efforts, we can often forget that it is God who leads us. The story of the Exodus reminds us that it is God, not Moses, who led the people to the promised land, Deuteronomy 31, uh, uh, verse 3, and uh, 32, verse 52. When we understand life as a gift, the brevity of human life ceases to be a problem. It becomes an opportunity for prayer to ask God for wisdom to discern the significance of human experience and 
for God's gift of fruitful work uh, in life. And, you know, God, uh, I mean, gives us orientation and perspective. Verse 13 in this section is a request for God to forgive human sinfulness. Sin arouses the wrath of God when we trespass the limits that God has set. The psalmist asks God to show compassion and mercy so that the community of faith may glorify God to the next generation. In this section, the juxtaposition of human time and God's time indicates that God's time is primary. And so our time must be measured finally in terms of God's own time. And so the psalmist ends with a petition to God and asks God to relent and to increase the days of joy to as many as the days of affliction. Again, some questions for reflection. What do we gain when we affirm God's permanence and the brevity of human life? Do tertiary education centers impart such wisdom today? In our questioning of the methods that we apply in our ministry on campus, it is pleasing to know, and there was a session earlier on one of the evenings when we were looking at the form of education itself, the structural aspects of education itself. And so we need to think of the campus not as a neutral space, but a space where, you know, we need, is a contested space in terms of, you know, power and in terms of, you know, the, uh, I mean, the, um, I mean, the, the, the things that, you know, could, I mean, could take away from uh, it be being a space where wisdom is actually uh, imparted. And so Christians have a place in you know, seeking to provide uh, the campus as a space where truly you know, wisdom would be imparted. What does measuring students' lifespan on campus in eternal perspective impart to the IFES ministry? Life on campus is very transient four years, three years, seven years at the most, you know, uh, for uh, those who do uh, degrees that take longer. But still, it continues, you know, to, uh, we continue to have a very high turnover of students. What does it mean to measure that life within the perspective that this psalm uh, gives us? Finally, I would like to just uh, outline, you know, some of what I see as the lessons, you know, that uh, the, this psalm, you know, highlights. Firstly, the link between sin and death that invokes uh, the uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. The human need to acknowledge that God owns everything and to correspond our actions with God's work and reign in the world. Thirdly, that human life is only meaningful when guided by God. And fourthly, God's greatness gives perspective to human fine, fine tune. During the time of the COVID pandemic, we learned uh, to gain perspective uh, in ways that will continue to profoundly affect the way we come to life and the way we come you know, to ministry. The cycle of student life on campus is brief, like I said, when, but when viewed in eternal perspective, we can begin to draw you know, from you know, what this psalm teaches us, you know, a fountain of wisdom. Praying Psalm 90 expands our view of God and checks human arrogance. 
And some of that uh, human arrogance is expressed uh, in our life today, you know, as technology advances, you know, death-defying uh, artificial intelligence, for instance, can give us a sense of, a false sense of invincibility. But as we see, uh, you know, what we see in the psalm, you know, gives us a sense of proportion and a sense of perspective. Finally, uh, this psalm situates life within God's purposes from generation to generation, the God who is faithful through all generations. In conclusion, I would like to offer this final word. In the final analysis, uh, Psalm 90 functions like the song of praise as a call to decision. We are called to entrust ourselves and our allotted time to God with assurance that grounded in God's work and God's time, our lives and labors participate in the eternal. In Psalm 90, life is finally an act of faith and not an act in futility, even though life is considered, human life that is, is considered as, you know, uh, being uh, brief. The psalm underlines that God can manifest his work and establish human work in the same manner that God dealt with Moses. So despite our human frailty, despite our fine-tuned, God promises to establish you know, our work. It's a paradox that we need to hold in a healthy tension and that we need to celebrate that despite being unable to conquer where we think we can, God finally triumphs on our behalf because God is a God of generations and God commits to us as refuge, as security, and as the promise to for fruitfulness of all that we do. That is a profound thought, my sisters and brothers. Our God is truly a God of refuge. Terry Makasi. Thanks for tuning in to this talk. We've got a new one dropping every Wednesday. And if you're loving what you hear, show us some love by subscribing and liking the podcast. And don't forget to stay connected with us on all social media platforms, including WhatsApp at IFES World.